Hello, my name is Michael Forey. At the Wolverine mine, I was shop steward for C Crew for the United Steelworkers. I had 424. I was on the mine rescue team. I had level 3 first aid. I did pretty well. It was a very dangerous job, and I worked 84 hours a week straight. March 24th, 2013, I was almost killed in Camden's British Columbia. I don't remember much about it. The first thing I do remember is this. I just became really awake. I'm looking through my eyes. But I can't move an eyelash, I can't move a limb, I can't move anything. But I can see. Inside my brain is just going a million miles an hour. My brain is just careening, just going like a pinball machine inside, just going like nuts, berserk. I can't speak, I can't move. But I can see my daughter standing against the wall right in front of me, screaming that I'm breaking her heart. <laughs> she wants her dad back. <laughs> what am I doing? <sighs> and I can't move. I can't move anything. But my brain is careening inside my eyes. And I think to myself, I thought, if this is what my life is, I'm in hell. This is hell.
first months of hospital, like, I was in a coma for three weeks, three and a half weeks. I don't really know anything about it because, to be honest with you, I was dead. I don't know anything. I had a tracheostomy, I had a scar, I was stitched here. This part of my skull was taken out, like nine inches by six inches, gone to alleviate the pressure and save my brain that was swollen so much. Either that or I was dead. But to be honest with you, I was dead. So for months and months, I didn't know I was even alive. And bit by bit, like, I came back to life. Like I started moving my fingers. I could feel half my arm was alive. But they had to teach me how to swallow, how to breathe. They took the tube out of my throat through the tracheostomy. I'd lost 55 pounds and they basically had to teach me how to be alive again. So for a long time I didn't know I was alive. After a while I was shipped down to uh, Lionsky Hospital in Vancouver. A four hour trip took, I think it was four or five ambulances to get me down there. They shipped me down there with a big chunk of my skull missing. Skinny, 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 strapped to a bed in the back of an ambulance, talking to me like I was a corpse, because I pretty well was a corpse. So I was in intensive care in Lions Gate, and first of all, they put me in a room with two other people that I didn't like because I didn't want to be around anybody because even though this part of my skull was missing this part here is the one that was damaged the part of reason and logic and I didn't really have reason or logic anymore I just didn't like being around people so I got irritated really quickly so I didn't like being around people even when I ate I ate by myself. It's gone on for a long time. People would come and visit me. And I started to realize that people did actually care about me. But my whole brain matter was taking a long time to come back. If I stood up in hospital, I would fall over because I lost so much weight that my muscle group was gone. I took little protein drinks to try and get my muscle group back. I was in Lionsgate for five months. I'd go to cognitive assessment classes downstairs and try and get my thinking back. I sleep for like 15 minutes, waking up for 45, sleep for 10, waking up for 30. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't stay awake, I couldn't do anything properly. I got a phone call that night back up in Mackenzie from Michael's friend that he was with to tell me that Michael had been in an altercation and that he had a small cut on his head that would require a couple of stitches up at Kamloops Royal Inland Hospital 
and then that maker would call me. It, just within seconds of the phone call finishing, I just got this feeling in my, pit in my stomach. Mother's intuition? I don't know. Anyway, I decided to call Royal Inland Hospital and I asked for emergency and they said, well, who are you looking for? And I said my son's name, Michael John Forey, Michael John Francis Forey. Oh no dear, said the receptionist. He's up in intensive care. What? So she transferred me to, to the intensive care neurology department where I was informed that Michael was meantime in surgery. And that they were fighting for his life. I looked out the window. It was a white out. There was no way I could drive anywhere that night. So we spent the night calling everybody we could, you know, my daughter in Vancouver. Uh, and, you know, Michael's daughter Ariel happened to be staying with her that, at that time. So by the time I managed to drive down the next day, when the roads had been cleared a bit, I went into the Royal Inland Hospital, up to the intensive care unit, and there was my daughter Anne, her daughter Natasha, and Michael's daughter Ariel coming out of this little room on the left hand side. They were all sobbing. Natasha was and Anne were basically holding Ariel up. Her legs were buckling under her. When I went to the room, I thought, my God, I'm too late. He's gone. But no, Michael was still there. He was fighting like hell. He was going to fight all the way for his life. One of the things I did notice was one of the drip stands had a sign on it that, that said, left side removed. And it turned out this meant that the left hand side of his skull had been removed. Wow, what a, you know, what an awful, awful feeling for any parent to see that. But I knew that Michael was a fighter and that if there was any chance of him coming back, he would. I came out of it bit by bit. Like, I, I can remember, I could feel like bits of my fingers and I could feel my jaw just reeling and ringing. It was so smashed up, all of this. And I had stitches down here. This was all busted. All this was smashed up. My skull was gone. So there was a big dip in my head. And I had a tracheostomy. And a tube running down my throat. They had to start teaching me how to swallow again and breathe because I was hooked up to, I think it was like 11 machines. I was surrounded by machines and wrapped up in bandage. I was just like something in a film. Even though this part of my head was missing, this is the part that was damaged the most. This is the part that deals with things like logic and reason. So even if you start thinking again, you don't think properly like you would normally. Nothing was the same. I was and I am a completely different person. I'm in a Lions Gate intensive care unit and I meet the brain surgeon or neurologist or whatever, I'm not sure what the hell you call him. And he said that, I'm not sure, I, I don't remember too much, but they said they, they think they might have lost this part of my skull. I'm not sure if he was joking, but he said he could make me another piece. But 
I didn't really, I couldn't think straight. People would come to visit me. I would recognize some people, the people closest to me. Like I didn't even know them. Like my mother, my mom. I don't know who the hell she was. And my daughter was just far apart. When I was in Lionsgate Hospital, two detectives came down from Kamloops to interview me about the incident. They told me what had happened. I was assaulted at the 7-Eleven store. He was well known to the RCMP. He had a big history. He'd done lots of things, lots of crime. It was, it was all caught on film. They also told me that he was under the care of the British Columbia government. But I got a distinct impression by the way they were talking that not much was going to happen about this. I just had that feeling. He took my DNA because in smashing me up the back of the head with a skateboard as I walked away from this guy, the skateboard hitting my head left my DNA on the skateboard. So they drove all the way down, interviewed me, DNA me, and took off. But I just felt nothing was going to happen. And my God, was I right? Because nothing did happen. In fact, quite the opposite. When I was in Lions Gate, towards the end, I started going to classes like cognitive assessment, stuff like that, trying to get my brain to work properly. Some classes I could do. Some things I just couldn't do. It was just beyond frustrating. It was like trying to go two plus two equals um, uh, I don't know. Some things I just couldn't do anymore. It took a long time and it was beyond frustrating. It was like, you're dead. Since this injury was so massive to me, my mom had power of attorney for all my financial affairs. Victim services is an organization that's supposed to reimburse people, victims of crime. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what they're supposed to do. But my mom, she kept all the receipts for the hotels. And from my mom, my dad, my daughter, Ariel, who was 14, my sister Anne, my niece, Natasha, kept all the hotel bills fuel costs. And sent them all to victim services looking for a reimbursement. My mom had also smashed up her van, rolled it and endowed it into a creek upside down, hit black ice on her way to come and see me with Ariel in the vehicle. They survived. Ariel like got on the highway at night and flagged down a semi, a B chain, and got him to stop. Got the RCMP to come and help, which he did. Thank God. Four days later, my dad took my truck, a brand new truck, and drove it off a 120 foot cliff at Williams Lake. He survived. The truck was wrecked. All of this went to victim services. They were supposed to reimburse his money. Six months after the incident, they wrote to my mother and said this. According to them, looking at the RCMP files of the incident, this was entirely my fault. I'd asked for it. This isn't me making this up. I have this in writing and I'll show it to you. My God, does he ever have a criminal record? He's been on probation longer than the day is long. Over and over and over and over again. 
but according to victim services, this is my own fault, and they reimbursed nothing. This was my fault, my daughter's fault, my sister's fault, my niece's fault, my father's fault, and my mother's fault. We got nothing back. My ma, who is Citizen of the Year in Squamish, British Columbia, for her amazing work organizing the food bank and Christmas care to help other people feed themselves and be good people, was now humiliated into the point of having to go to the food bank to feed my daughter because this financially ruined us. That's what happens if you survive attempted murder in Canada. That's what happens. Victim services are a service for victims. The victims are a service for the victim services to stay a service. That's how it works. It's oxymoronic. This happened six months before the trial. They decided that. Once Michael got moved down to the uh, Lionsgate Hospital, we decided it was time to send all the receipts that we had been told to keep. Um, victims and services had approached me up at the Kamloops Hospital and told me to keep all the receipts for hotels and fuel and anything else that we needed to pay for to be able to come and visit Michael. So we had all these receipts. So when Michael got transferred down to Lionsgate to be near us in Squamish and his daughter in Vancouver, we thought, okay, now's a good time to send them in. Well, after much to and fro arguing, and listening to the BS that comes out of the mouths of these people from victim services, we realized that there is no such thing as victim services. We were refused any of the money back because Michael had argued with a kid. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been in an argument I certainly have been in an argument, but that does not give me the right to pick up a longboard and attempt to kill somebody. That's what it was, attempted murder. Then we started looking for a lawyer to go through all the procedures and 
to hopefully get some kind of compensation for Michael for what he had been through and what he was going to be going through the rest of his life. We had been told that Michael was now an epileptic, super sensitive to any kind of noises, would have severe mood swings, and he was now unemployable. So where do you go? You start with your Prime Minister, so you write to Mr. Trudeau's office. You tell them what happened and what you're hoping for. It takes them about four and a half months to get back to you. And basically they say, we're very sorry. This is a provincial situation, not federal. Okay. So you contact, I contacted my MP, Jordan Sturdy's office. We contacted different offices in Victoria. Nobody wants to know because you're going to be suing the province because this teenager was a ward of the province of British Columbia at the time and nobody wanted to know. Nobody wanted to know. I find that just so distasteful that my son was willing to go out and work, wasn't taking any money from the government, was paying his taxes, but when he needed help from them, nobody cared. Nobody cared. So then you start looking for private lawyers. Uh, only if you've got I think the cheapest we were offered was that a lawyer would take on the case as if we had $18,000 down payment. Usually it was twenty-five dollars to $35,000 they wanted to take on the case. We don't have that kind of money. Never did. In fact, if it hadn't been for Michael's co-workers up at the Wolverine Mines send, you know, having a, a, a collection and sending this money, or my family in, in Scotland all whip, having a whip round and sending us money, I don't know where we would have been. Before I moved to Mackenzie, I had been the president of the Food Bank. bank. I had organised a logger sports parade, started the Santa Claus parade, and you know, just other community involvement things. Once I came, moved back to Squamish and we were in this situation where we no longer had a, you know, a top up from Michael's wages or anything like that, I went from president of the food bank to someone who needed their help. Can you imagine how degrading that is? You know, you've been used to writing people's details down about how many in their family and stuff. And now you're in the lineup waiting to get some free veggies, a couple of cans of soup. So, where do we go from here? Well, Mike and I are back down in Squamish living in a low income apartment block. We basically struggle to get by month by month. Um, pensions aren't that great and so we depend on cutting back here and cutting back there. Michael has lost contact with his sister, his niece and now his daughter because of his mood swings that he has no control over. And he is living on a boat that is not in good shape, that needs a lot of work done electric-wise, to be made waterproof. Um, you know, he's, he's living basically on a shack, in a shack that floats. So I'm calling out the province of British Columbia. You really need to start looking after your victims. The young fella who assaulted my son, 
for 18 months probation. Probation, yeah. And Michael, Michael's case was the 33rd or 34th interaction he'd had with the RCMP. And he's only 16. Since then, he has assaulted other people using the longboard. Thank God he hasn't actually hit anybody else on the head. But he has, you know, threatened people. But the one thing that really gets to me is the fact that the night his probation finished, just on midnight, he had the audacity to send Michael an email saying, it was the best day of my life. My probation's over so I can talk to you. That was the best day of my life. I loved seeing you on the ground writhing in the blood and I would love to do it again but the next time I want to kill you and then I can come and piss on your grave. This is the mentality of this young man. I'm not going to give you his name because I don't think he warrants the acknowledgement. Now, while he is under the care of children and families, they knew what this kid was like, that he should not be out without a social worker. And yet they're willing to do that, let him go out in amongst the public and create havoc and ruin people's lives. So where do we go from here? I'm damned if I know. I have thought backwards, forwards, sideways, and still can't find any way of getting any kind of solution to this quandary. Michael has received not one penny in compensation. And I think that is disgusting and disgraceful and a slap in the face to the people from British Columbia. They deserve better. And um, we're, we're not making this video just for Michael. We're making it for all the others who have suffered traumatic brain injury as a result of crime and have received nothing. Michael is not the only one. And I'm sure, and I hate to say this, but I know that there will be others following who will get not a penny in compensation and just be grateful for what you've got. Well, I'm grateful every day. I'm grateful my son is up, walking, talking, doing his thing. But I still, still think that he should be compensated for what he's been through for what he's lost and for the pain and suffering that not just he's been through but my whole family has been through. So come on BC, get your acting gear, start helping people who are victims. This whole thing has completely destroyed who I was. I was a single dad, I owned a house in Mackenzie. I worked hard and a dangerous job. I lived upstairs with my daughter and my parents stood underneath. But since this happened, almost five years ago, I've been alone. The wreckage that has come in the aftermath has been horrific. It's like I survived physically, but mentally, I died. My daughter, I don't know her anymore, and she doesn't know me. We're not in touch anymore. I have a huge amount of PTSD, and so does she. But with me getting zero out of this, I can't own a house anymore. I can't be close to her. I can't offer her anything. I don't have a phone. I can't afford to do anything, I can't offer her what I did have, which was being her father. Those days are over, and she's a wreck, and so am I.
Until this happened, I was a single dad, a single parent. Did I want to be a single parent? Not really. Ariel's mother didn't really exist. Obviously she had a mother, but her mother just was never around. I'd gone through like a big international abduction when Ariel was only three months old. Her mother had taken her to the States, still in my car, emptied all my bank accounts. This is on Vancouver Island and taken her across the border. I was in the papers. It was a big deal. The Center for Missing and Exploited Children in, on Vancouver Island and in Canada were looking for her and the American Society for Missing and Exploited Children were looking for her too. It was a very big deal and it took me two years to find her. So when I got her back, Ariel was already a messed up kid and she's had a messed up life and at 14 to have her dad almost killed on screen by somebody who's not much older than her has been brutally hard on her because then I'm not her dad anymore so she's got no mother, no father the only person that's really helped her is my mother, my mom and that's heartbreaking because I want to be there for my daughter. I wish I could be, but the way that the government has worked against me, even though I'm the victim, I am truly the victim. And so is my daughter. So is my mother. So is my family. We have been crushed. Our human rights have been walked all over. Because now I've been alone for four, five years. And so is Ariel, mentally. PTSD is rampant. And that's something I want to try and defeat. But if you think you're gonna defeat it, you're wrong about that. You've got work around it. That's what I want help with. One thing about being a single father, a like single dad, was my connection to my daughter was brilliant, it was really good. Because a lot of Ariel was a lot like me. She was pretty unique. She's a very creative girl. She's a lovely person. She always said that she was a lot like me. And I really felt a close touch with her, like a close affinity to her. I felt that I could do things with her, talk to her, but since this happened, that has been broken, and I don't want to. I don't want it to be broken anymore. I want to get that back. She's 18 now, but her dealing with this, it's not going well, because she doesn't talk to me. She's not in touch with me anymore. She, as I said before, somewhat blames me for this. This isn't my fault, and it's not her fault. Even though victim services are horrific, and their explanation how this is all my fault. My God, are they ever wrong. I guess the, the distance between my daughter and I grew so great because after all this happened and I was in the hospital for so long, I did come out of the hospital completely a different person, thinking differently because my skull was smashed to bits and my brain was rattled. I was different. I am a different person. So Ariel was now living on the other side of the province, like, I think it was like 1,500 kilometers away. So I didn't see her. Even if I could drive there, I can drive there. So I never had a driver's license for years. I would be hitchhiking in minus 30 degrees to try and see her. But even when I did, she almost resented who I was because I wasn't the same. She almost blamed me for being there, for being me. She didn't understand that I didn't choose to be there. I 
wish it wasn't here. I wish it wasn't saying this to you. But I am. So I will. Because I don't think this is right. Revenge. Have I thought about it? Of course I've thought about it. When you, if your life is almost taken away from you, and one minute you're making a lot of money, you're a single dad, and you're doing your best, to you being in a coma, and then you're not a single dad, and you've got no money, you get no compensation, and you're alone, alone, and very alone, and you can't contact your daughter anymore, you can't live next to her, because you've got nothing from the government, no compensation. I want revenge in a whole bunch of ways, or I did. But regarding this guy, Che Kill Me, his revenge, or my revenge on him, is he's going to do it to himself. It's called karma. You can go around pretending you're like the big tough guy and everybody's impressed, but in actuality, you're just a sad little bastard that didn't get any mental help. And what you're going to do is try to be the little super superhero and be a coward on film. But you know what, man? What's going to stop happening eventually is it won't be on film anymore. And you're going to do this to the wrong person and they're going to take you out. And uh, even though you smash the bits, when you start to have the tools to put yourself back together, those are the tools that will put you back together. You can lay down and die, or you can stand up and live. And that's what I chose to do. I wasn't going to die. When I started to come through this bit by bit, it became really obvious to me, it became really like amazing to me, that even though I had just faced death, because I was literally dead until I was saved by being put in a coma, when you get on the other side of that and you're actually alive again, I was faced not with death, but by how many people actually cared for me and loved me. I was getting messages from all over the place, all over the world. And that meant a lot. Like, I think you go through life kind of forgetting that. You just kind of don't think about it. But when you were in a position, or if you were ever in a position, I hope you're never in that position, but if you were ever in a position that I was in, you could see it. And it is amazing that people do care for you, and people do love you. And that was one thing that really brought me back together. So, even though I've lost a great deal, Like, I wasn't, like, a solo person before, but now I'm very solo, because I'm not a parent anymore, I don't work, I've become very alone, but in being alone, I've really had time to get through this, and learn about this, read about this, I want to, f to further my education, I want to take what I've learned, my education, which has been truly the university of hard knocks because this has been brutal. I want to take what I've learned and help other people and I know I can do this through being creative. I want to help people through, that have been the victims of crime the military, who seem to be getting a really bad end of the stick, instead of like thinking about things that have happened, 
Like, you don't walk around and get blown up by an IED or shot with a 10 minute warning. It just happens. And then you live with that for the rest of your life. I didn't walk up to this place in 7-Eleven in Kamloops thinking, oh, I'm going to get killed. Hold on, this will only take a second. No, I didn't. It just happened. And now, for the last almost five years, I've been dealing with it. And I'll deal with it for the rest of my life. But I'm not going to lay down and die. I'm alive because I want to be alive. And I want to help other people stay alive. Mm. It's a PG song. Anyway. <laughs> but you know what I mean I want to further my education by going to university get a psychology degree I want to start an organization to help people I want compensated so I can have a home close to my daughter have a studio that I can paint in and also have people come to see me where I can let their creative side live too. Over the last few years, being an artist has been prominent in my life. It's really helped me get through PTSD taking my brain away from the downward spiral of depression and going over and over and over this again. I've had some pretty big art exhibits, like the Two Rivers Gallery in Prince George, Osaka, Japan, twice, and in Western Australia. I have a website I make like, paintings, I do a lot of photography, and I also do art on skulls. And it's not like I just go out and kill things to get the skulls. I'll go out and get skulls that have been left by poachers, so the skulls will be smashed to bits. But I'll take my time to put them back together, pay them respect by, by doing that. Put them back together and make art with them to show that you can be smashed to bits and you can be beautiful again because even though I was dead, that was what was done to me by the fine people at the Camus in that hospital. They are amazing people. So I'll show you some of my artwork too, okay? This is the, the boat that I live on. It's a 44 foot X trawler, wooden. It's not commercial anymore, but it was. It's a nice old boat. Needs a lot of work done to it, but need a lot of money to do that, which I don't have. And this is the stern. Stabilizers, main mast, and out there is the boom mast. Underneath it, you'll see some bits of bones, of some, some artwork I did, some moose antlers, and three bull skulls. Red one, the black one, which is the last one, and a natural skull. They're all engraved, apart from the moose, which is all paint. 
If I had the money, I could make this into a liveaboard, but it would mean cutting off this freezer and building back, which is a fair amount of money that I just don't have. So I live in the bridge, and I'll show you that. Let's go aboard. Okay, it'd be nice to see there's lots of room in here, but there's not. So I'll just walk you through it. It's pretty tiny, which is not good because I'm not exactly tiny. I'm like six foot three. But this is where I live. There's the bow. You'll see lots of tarps on there because water leaks down through the decks into the foxhole, which is underneath. It's all kind of cut out because it was wired up badly. So all the wiring is gone. Which means it needs to be rewired. There's the bed. It folds out. And I've got like, I have to push and pull boards. You can see the planks down there. I pull them out to make a, like a plywood level board. Not like a level board, but like a bed that I sleep on. I used to sleep on the floor, but not anymore. That rhymes, so there you go. There's a painting I did recently. I do a lot of that painting, skull art, and photography. There's another painting I did recently. I don't have photographs of my family or my daughter anymore because, to be honest with you, it's just too painful. I can't think like that. I read a lot and do a lot of artwork. There's a diesel stove, but it's not hooked up, so I cook on this little bugger of a camp stove, which is beating. And this electric one, which runs sometimes. And in any vessel, you've got to think about fire, because there's the gas stove, there's hydraulic fluid, and diesel, which could mean fire, which is a real thing to think about on a boat. There's a fire extinguisher and there's one down in the engine room, which is right underneath you. Okie dokie. So that's where I live. Not much to look at. I wish it was different, but it's not. It's pretty tiny. One thing that... I'll get you through this, and I hope you never go through this, because this is hell. I'm coming out of hell. I'm still kind of there because they don't see my daughter. I, I'm not in touch with her. I know I keep saying that, but it's true, and it, it's like a spear in my heart. But one thing that's gotten me through this is knowing that my life has been taken away, given back, and then taken away again in another way. But I'm going to build it up because I'm not stupid. I'm relatively intelligent. And if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your daughter, in your mother, and if you can look at the people who love you and see something in your independence and your ability to build from nothing to something, that will get you through this. If you have a heart, if you've got a heart and grow from that, you're gonna survive. And I will survive. I'm not going down with this crap. I'm not gonna bow down to it. Cause it's low, it's weak. And I'm stronger than that and I'm stronger than this. And I want to be somewhere that my daughter can come to. I want to start an organization that I can help people with PTSD. I want to be able to go to prisons and talk to people who are doing this. A lot of them are mental patients who never get any help. But I know I can help people. That's what keeps me going. I know I didn't get through this for nothing. I got through this because I have a purpose in life, because I love life and I want to give that to someone else. Peace.